And I realized, that's when I realized you were going to be in the project. So my dad first learned that I was going to be in Pegasus when he had been sent to Gettysburg and he had seen me there, which again is one of the weird sort of paradoxes of the whole set of experiences we had. Um, so then I asked him about Lincoln. I said, will you send me back again can I, so I can see Lincoln? He said, no. And I said, why not? And he goes, we're afraid that there'll be two images of you there. That's so wrong. So that, that was because I was being physically sent there to the actual event. See, that, that also is, is instructive. And that was from the plasma confinement chamber in East Hanover. But that wasn't a concern when we were visiting the Lincoln assassination site via three-dimensional chronovision back in summer of 71. You see? Yeah. When they were physically sending me there via plasma confinement, and I was actually time traveling. Did they I... didn't want to send me there again, again to the same event because there would be two versions of me there. That's what your but father told sending, you, right? When they were sending me via chronovision to sample you know, repeatedly to the Lincoln speech site, that didn't occur to that's why, so, what your father told you, right? When you asked if you could go back. Yeah, I, I was crestfallen because, actually, I had played Abraham Lincoln in a school play around that time. And I said, oh, Dad, won't you send me back so I can see Abraham Lincoln? Uh, give the Gettysburg Address, you know, because I, I, I was really guilty. I had seen the side of his face and body at the Chronovision probes from New Mexico, but I hadn't stood in front of the stage and seen Abraham Lincoln give the Gettysburg Address. And I was really crestfallen that I wanted to, and he said, nope. And I said, why not? And he goes, because that's actual t uh, time travel, and and you'll there'll be two versions of you there. And then when I saw the image of myself in a news magazine, I took it to him. I said, Dad, look, they got an image of me. I think it was in Life or Look magazine. They published that, that picture that had been discovered of, of the Lincoln speech site in 1951, and it had been analyzed to show that Lincoln was in the picture. And... Um, I said I took it to my father and said, "Look, Dad, they they photographed me when when he was there." And he said, and he said, "Yep, just don't tell anybody." And then after I got back home, you know, a couple of weeks after the basically the fiasco where I missed seeing Lincoln give the Gettysburg Address, I had like this cosmic, you know, massive Bart Simpson moment where I was crestfallen that <laughs> they had sent me to Gettysburg and I failed to see the speech that Lincoln gave there. I asked my dad about Lincoln, and what he said was that. Lincoln just looked like a man with a beard on the stage, but what he couldn't get out of his mind is how high-pitched his voice was. He said he had this stringy, high-pitched voice, and my dad imitated him. He went, four score and seven years ago. You know, so Lincoln had a really high-pitched voice, which is something interesting that my father observed from standing in front of him when he was giving the speech. Now we know that Lincoln had a disease called Marfan syndrome, which stress, stretches the connective tissue and sometimes stretches the vocal cords. And it's such a tall, thin person as Lincoln, apparently his vocal cords were stretched. So, Interesting. That's, a, that's a fascinating corroboration, because I remember my dad saying that, just like that. He said, yeah, he had, he had this really high-pitched, stringy voice, and then he imitated it like I just did. And so then we later found out that Lincoln had Marfan syndrome. So that's, that was one of, the many, one of the many internal proofs that I've developed about my experiences. Certainly not the only one. Certainly the photograph is demonstrative of the fact that it's me, because if you examine that photograph, you see that that, that boy is, is in the pantaloons of a Union Bugle Boy outfit, but he has a Union parka on and grossly oversized men's shoes. I'm talking about like size 14 men's shoes. Yeah. Touched in the head, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you also traveled into the future, correct? Yes, there... They, they were sending us to a location in front of a, a very beautiful green glass building at a kind of an industrial park in the southwest somewhere in the year 2045 through this very large black anvil-shaped time gate that they constructed on the gymnasium floor in the gym, the basketball court or gym floor. Um, in the Cerritos Cultural Center building or you know, complex in the summer of 72. And we were still getting training in that building. And when we saw that thing going up, we just groaned and went, oh, God, now we're going to have to jump through that. But this was this big gate-shaped kind of anvil-shaped thing, like a big, it looked like a big printing press with different electromagnetic components and lights and stuff on it that they built on the floor of the, uh, of the gym there in Cerritos. And there was a, a notch of blue light at the bottom, kind of a dense blue light. And 
and we ran up a, a ramp with some of that black no skid rubber mat on it mm-hmm. and ran through the portal which was the dense uh, doorway of dense blue neon blue light and again teleported very quickly and popped out in, in, in 2045 now the explanation there is that this was this was a, a teleport that generated a much denser energy field and, and hence a much more effective mortal tunnel. In other words, now we were literally jumping to 2045 in a couple seconds. Um, what is 2045 like? What is the future like there? It was sort of a, a garden suburb, sort of industrial park, like an R&D center, like tr- Research Triangle Park in, in North Carolina, kind of like that. It was a very opulent green glass building. There were no cars. There was no pollution. There were large grassy areas with very beautifully landscaped trees and shrubs. And on the the, the large sidewalks, which were sort of like some of those large walkways that you find on university campuses, people were going by on those sedgeways that Dean Kamen invented. You mean sedgeways? I remember seeing those. Sedgeways? I remember saying to my dad. I remember saying to my dad, Dad, these people are going by on these things that look like lawn fertilizers that they stand on top of and lean forward. Okay. And he, said, he says, yeah, we saw those. That's some kind of invention that somebody comes along with. Segways. The segways. Yeah. The it. Yeah. So in this big college campus-like setting, sort of a research triangle park with very opulent glass buildings and these big, wide walkways... So there were a few people went, you know, I saw one time a guy went by past the building very pretty, pretty rapidly on a sedgeway, like at 20, 20 miles per hour or so. So um, it was a steady state society that had survived whatever environmental vicissitudes or population pressures or whatever the world had been subjected to in the intervening years. It clearly was a sustainable society. More and of a I garden aside, paradise. When I went inside, I noticed that the people working there looked kind of young and tall. And as I walked in the second or third time, I, actually, I realized that I did multiple trips to that building. <laughs> did they dress you for that time, too? Did they dress you for that time? Otherwise, you would no, have stood out. I was just, just dressed in my ordinary clothing that I was wearing in New Mexico. And, in fact, people's clothing was a little bit more Star trek but it really wasn't that much different than our time. It was a little bit more... So you didn't stand kind of out. like these, these office pants suits, but... I think one of the guys I was actually interacting with was even in a suit and tie, so he may have been an engineer from my dad's side of the project who was who was stationed there. Interesting. Okay. But 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 um, I now I, I was just thinking I, I was sent there numerous times because I entered the building different times to get the data scrolls, and one time when I did, these two kind of office gals, they were like tall, attractive young women who were clearly working there as researchers or whatever, walked past me, and one was. A Caucasian woman and another was a kind of a light-skinned black lady. They were both very pretty, I remember. And 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 the African American woman turned to the the Caucasian woman and po- and then pointed to me. And under her breath, all excited, said, "Oh, that's Andy. That one must be Andy. Look, that's Andy right there." Because I had been known to them in their time as a result of my my book and my public lectures about my experiences in Pegasus in this time. And I'm, I'm presumably the movie that's going to be made about my experiences. So, so you're famous, and I, they recognize you time traveling into their time. <coughs> well, I was in their project location, so they may have been briefed on the history of the project. So their knowledge of me as people who were probably born around 20, 2020, um, because they were on 25 years old, it was 2045, uh, maybe 20, 25 or 30 years old. I, I'd say maybe mid to late 20s. I'll be about 60 they, in that time. They who I, they, oh, I don't know how they knew who I was, but they did know who I was. So it could have been from their own project training, because my, my involvement in the project they would have been briefed on, because I was going to be one of the kids who was going to show up. But I think it was more of the fact that, at least during their training, if not in general cultural terms, they knew that I was the teller of the tale. 